you know, our program voluntarily stopping eating and drinking, exploring an end of life option for suffering patients. This is introduction number two. Uh, I'm Terry Cohen. It seems like nothing changes. At any rate, I also serve as, they have noted, as president happening of EOLC and And we're privileged to have two experts speaking. I will introduce both of them, and they will each talk for exactly 22.5 minutes. <laughs> and there will be no revisions of that stricture. They are, respectively, Dr. Judy Schwartz and Dr. Timothy Kirk, or if you prefer, Judy and Tim. <coughs> Judy Schwartz is the clinical director of End of Life Choices New York, previously known as, many of you do know, as Compassionate Choices of New York. And for more than a decade, she's counseled terminally ill and suffering patients and their families about end of life options and choices. She has a PhD in nursing research from New York University, as well as other degrees, and a certification program in bioethics and medical humanities from Columbia University. Has taught widely, spoken widely, and internationally, most recently, at an international conference on subjects like these in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands. Tim, Tim Kirk is currently assistant professor of philosophy at the City University of New York, New York College, where he specializes in philosophy of nursing and healthcare ethics with an emphasis on hospice and palliative care. And in addition to his appointment at CUNY, he serves as ethics consultant to the VNA New York Hospice and Palliative Care. He is adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Population Health Division of Medical Ethics at NYU Langone Medical Center and adjunct assistant professor at the NYU College of Nursing. Judy's going to talk first for exactly 22.5 minutes, uh, followed then by the Tim. I'm going to ask each of them, and both of them, jointly, a couple of questions, and then immediately thereafter, we'll turn it over to you. There'll be microphones on both sides. We want this to be a discussion as much as a lecture series. And we hope that you will participate avidly. You can stay as long as you like, and even when you're done, you can hang around for a while. We're very glad to have you here. Welcome to EOLC NY. individualized counseling to New Yorkers who are living with incurable and progressive and difficult diseases and making tough decisions. So we're glad you're here. We want to continue to hear from you. And I'll tell you, the way you get a hold of us is by calling our number, which I will tell you now, but I'll also tell you at the end, which is 212-252-2015. So that having been said, <coughs> Perhaps you're wondering uh, why we chose this topic of VSED. VSED stands for Voluntarily Stopping Eating and Drinking. And VSED is just faster to say, so that's what I say, VSED, right? <laughs> so you may be wondering, why did we have this discussion? Why this topic? Despite our ongoing efforts to pass legislation and to successfully litigate a case that we brought, the challenges the laws against physician aid and dying in this state, we're not there yet. We haven't succeeded. And there are currently many suffering patients who can't wait. They need help now. VSED is a legal and ethical option for suffering patients 
who have no other good options that allows them to control the circumstances in time of death. However, there can be no doubt that BSED is rarely anyone's first choice. But some suffering patients and their families can't wait for legislation or litigation. So what I plan to discuss today, despite what Terry says about 22 minutes and a half, uh, first of all, I'm going to define what BSED is, because it's important that we're clear about what we're talking, about what we're speaking. Then I'm going to describe a little bit about the process, what's necessary for success, and how I am defining success. And then I'll describe the two main groups of patients that seem most interested <coughs> in this option and, and from whom we hear from the most. The end of my talk is going to focus on a particular, the particular issues and challenges that come with a patient who has been recently diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and is interested in the possibility of this option. So that'll be towards the end. So, so let's be clear about what we mean by these said and what it is and what it is not. VSED, Voluntary Stopping and Integrating, is understood as a voluntary, conscious, and intentional choice, a decision to hasten death by foregoing all further oral intake. The cause of death is dehydration, not starvation. And with appropriate support, and by appropriate support, I mean medical, social, and caregiving support, death usually occurs approximately two weeks after the beginning of the fast. VSED is associated with the gradual loss of consciousness, sometimes towards the end of the first week, and generally leads to a peaceful death towards the end of the second week. Depending, though, and it's important to note, upon the underlying disease state of the patient. And occasionally, the fast does take longer than 14 days. And often that's because the patient and or the family felt the need to have small bits of fluid or maybe ice chips. And perhaps that prolongs the process of dying, but it's about comfort, right? It's not about suffering. So the key to success, and again, that success is in quotes, and by success, I mean a peaceful, gentle death that occurs generally within that two-week window. The key is to not drink. Eating is not an issue. People seem to lose a, a need for hunger. They don't have much in the way of hunger pains after the first couple of days. Going without fluid is a challenge. I think it's also important to remember that people have been dying this way for generations, right? Back in the day, when we talked about dying and it wasn't hidden, grandpa or grandma would know when it was time. They would go into their bed, they turn their face to the wall, and they would just wait until they died. And it was accepted as a natural part of living. <coughs> Grandkids were still playing on the floor in grandpa or grandma's bedroom. It was accepted as a decision or not. It just happened. Now what happens in 2016, right? Death is this scary business that we don't talk about, right? And for some people, the notion of the inevitability of dying is so scary that they can't talk about it at all. And they certainly are not going to make any plans for a, quote, good death. That topic, that subject, that issue is very individualized, right? It requires, at the very least, reflection. So happily, the folks here, you folks, know about that, right? Or you wouldn't be here. Uh, what I want to talk about next is my, my colleague, Tim, is going to discuss some of the ethical and practical issues that hospice clinicians face when hospice patients ask their caregivers for information about speeding the dying process. The two groups of patients that we see most often are those who are already terminally ill and are in hospice. They sometimes feel that their dying is intolerable. It's 
siblings are unbearable, or the process is taking too long, and that's what Tim's going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about that. I am going to spend most of my time talking about a different group of patients, folks who are living with incurable and progressive diseases, but they don't yet have a terminal diagnosis. So when we're thinking about this particular group of patients, right, incurable and progressive, and who knows exactly when they're going to die, who amongst that group would be a, quote, appropriate candidate for BSAT? And an appropriate candidate, in my experience, has the following. They're experiencing continuous and unendurable suffering. For example, living with that kind of suffering they have concluded that the burdens of living outweigh the benefits. <coughs> right, so that's number one. Number two, they have decisional capacity. They're able to make a voluntary, thoughtful, and considered fully informed decision about this option. And three, they have a determined will to hasten their own death. And that's very important. Plus, the fourth item has several parts to it. They have a supportive family group or close friends. They have access to 24-7 caregiving support when they're no longer able to get out of bed. And they have access to either medical, palliative, or hospice oversight. One of those medical oversight is necessary. Now, this option is not for everyone, and I do want to stress that that's in fact the case. The person, him or herself, must be able to assume moral responsibility for their own death. And that takes thoughtful determination, and it cannot be delegated to anybody else. In addition, there are challenges to this option, right? You can't do it alone. And this comes as very bad news for many people, perhaps, in this audience as well. There are many folks who really like to do things themselves, and there are other people who feel like maybe they don't have anybody in their immediate circle that they can count on or that they can turn to. But I speak from a decade of experience, and this is what I know. The other thing I know is that I strongly recommend access to medical or palliative oversight throughout the whole of this process. Now, palliative oversight can be provided by a palliative care physician. So long as that palliative care physician is sympathetic to and understands a decision to stop eating and drinking. If they do and if they will support this choice, you're practically home free. What you do need is palliative medication ordered by that physician to be available at the bedside. And you also need to be sure that the doc will sign a death certificate when you die. So these are things that need to be in place and they can all be worked out ahead of time, particularly if you have a decent relationship, ideally a long-term relationship with your physician. It's important to have access to and available sedating and analgesic medications. Uh, particularly in the beginning of the fast, when going without fluid can be particularly challenging, it's nice to be able to be more sleepy than not with these sedating or, or palliative medications. But if, you are, if your primary care physician will support this, in my experience, physicians, I mean patients and families and caregivers can usually manage quite well. <coughs> Sometimes, however, as death nears and organ failure begins, patients can exhibit signs of agitation or delirium, and they need to be able to be sedated. They have to be sedated with sedating medication that must be available at the bedside. So again, you have to have an informed physician who know, understands this process and who will order this medication to have it available. Ideally, you have access to hospice oversight, but Tim's going to talk all about that. Um, the other thing that is a challenge with this particular choice is family or friends at the bedside must be prepared ahead of time for the possibility that the patient 
will have to change heart. Or they will change their convictions about what they thought they were going to do. Perhaps it's harder than they thought. Or perhaps they actually are not ready. It may be too soon in their process of living with this disease. These possibilities and the way to handle them need to be discussed ahead of time. And what ought to drive the decision making is what the patient wants to have happen. No question, however, though, the possibility of ambivalence or symptoms that seem to be causing the patient distress can lead to caregiver caregivers to experience moral distress. I mean, this is tough stuff. I mean, this can be really complicated, particularly if you're not sure whether your loved one has, in fact, had a change of heart or whether it's just the underlying disease, the progression of disease, or the organ failure that's causing them to not be able to make an informed choice. And again, I would say, going without fluids for some people is very challenging. And while soothing interventions can be provided, and they should be provided, to alleviate the feeling of a dry mouth, um, I urge patients and families to be gentle with themselves. If the patient is really wanting to have a sip of something, give them a sip of something. If they want to have some ice chips, have ice chips. So if it prolongs the process a little bit, the whole point here is comfort and as peaceful a death as we can manage. So it takes a little bit longer. This is not supposed to be anything but the least bad death that we can manage. So the, there are additional challenges caused by very advanced age and the diminishing memory and cognitive abilities that are associated with such dementing diseases as Alzheimer's and end-stage Parkinson's disease. Interestingly, we are hearing from a growing number of patients who've been newly diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, and they're seeking information and support. They want to know what kind of end-of-life options are available to them. The very first thing we talk about is, tell me about your advanced directives, right? What have you completed? What do you have? Who's your agent? Do they know, for example, your healthcare agent, are, are you sure that they really don't ever want to have artificial nutrition and hydration, no tube feeding, you've checked that off? That's sort of a no-brainer these days, right? Everybody knows about that. And there are other forms, and all of that information, by the way, can be downloaded from our website. There's all kinds of information about the different forms that you ought to have. And you need to redo these every couple of years, particularly with a new diagnosis like Alzheimer's or something serious like that. In addition to that, however, we are now strongly recommending that when you complete or change or revise your advanced directive, you consider the following situation. For those who have been diagnosed recently with early onset Alzheimer's in particular, do you want to be hand-fed in the event that you lose decisional capacity and the ability to feed yourself? You need to think about that. And you need to have a very clear conversation with your healthcare agent, with your physician, and with your family members. Because what often happens in the final months and sometimes the final years of Alzheimer's disease is that patients will continue to open their mouths when a spoon is put at the side of their mouth. It's a reflex, like a little baby bird. Their mouth opens, and the caregiver drops the block encourages them to swallow, and they swallow. It's not a decision to eat. It's not a choice that they're making to eat. It's a reflex. And unless there is a very clearly written document that says, don't do this to me, I don't want to be hand-fed, you will be, because it appears to caregivers that the patient is cooperating in the eating process, right? We're not talking about holding their nose to get them to open their mouth. And this appears to be a willing, cooperative movement. And it is a tremendous problem for caregivers in institutional settings to not feed somebody under those circumstances. And, and indeed, we will tell you 
write a very specific addendum to your advanced directive saying that you don't want to be hand-fed if this is what you decide is right for you, and it may not be. You don't want to be hand-fed in the event that you lose capacity and ability to feed yourself. Include also that you understand the consequence of that decision will be a hastened of death. Have it witnessed, have it signed, show it to your family attorney, your healthcare agent, every other member of your family, everybody needs to know about it, and your primary care physician, and make lots of copies. Everybody needs to know that this is a decision that you thoughtfully made over time and that you expect it to be honored. Now, generally speaking, that will be honored if you're at home. You're going to be in big trouble, however, if you're in an institutional setting. Um, there are very significant challenges for people who are in long-term care settings. Long-term care staff may well have competing or conflicting professional responsibilities. Well, instructive advanced directives, written advanced directives, or, 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 or the voice of a healthcare agent ought to be heard and respected. Long-term care clinicians are also required to provide care, to be sure that their patients, their residents, don't lose a lot of weight. They need to be responsive to the clinical guidelines and oversight that the federal government assesses for, for, for long-term care facilities. And so long as a resident appears willing to eat, they will be fed. Bottom line. And furthermore, you should know that there's a piece of New York State health care law that carves out an exception for hand feeding in the legal definition, definition of health care in both the Health Care Proxy Act and the Family Health Care Decisions Act. The legislation stipulates in the definition of health care that providing nutrition and hydration, and I'm quoting here, providing nutrition and hydration orally without reliance on medical treatment is not health care. So presumably the law, the legislators, the legislation has said to health care agents, once that patient loses capacity, you can't decide whether they're going to be fed or not. If they are willing to eat, they're going to be fed because it's not a health care decision. It's caring. It's ordinary care. And so this is a real problem if you're in an institutional setting. In New York State, I mean, our organization, um, we're looking for a test case. We're looking for somebody who has written one of these statements saying they don't want to be fed, and they have an agent that supports that wish, and then they lose capacity, and that decision or request is not honored. We think that this should be litigated. We don't think it's right. Uh, we think that people should be able to make an advanced directive that's honored in all healthcare settings. Now, about those people, finally, let's get back to who've been newly diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. As I said, we're hearing from more of this group of patients. For many people, a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease is more frightening than a diagnosis of cancer. Although considered a terminal disease, the terminal stage of Alzheimer's requires an absence of all of the following abilities. The ability to recognize loved ones, communicate by speech, ambulate, and maintain bowel and bladder control. Death is usually expected one to two years after that stage. We know from years of data collected in Oregon where physician aid and dying is legally available, the primary reason people choose a hastened death is to avoid the suffering caused by the lack of control or the lack of autonomy or the inability to do things that make life worth living. It's also true, and it needs to be said, that with a diagnosis of an Alzheimer's disease, you're not eligible for physician aid and dying, even in those states that have legalized aid and dying, because in order to be eligible for a physician's assistant, you have assistance, you have to be both terminally ill and decisionally capable. 
So clearly with Alzheimer's disease, sadly, by the time you're in this terminal stage, you have long since lost the ability to make an important choice. For some folks, the, the certainty of cognitive disability dependence and the need for long-term care placement during the final stages of this disease are unendurable. Learning about VSET can be a real comfort to them. If they have no other life-sustaining treatments that can be stopped, like that, an implanted cardiac defibrillator, that'll work. <laughs> Often they don't. They're otherwise pretty healthy folks. And if they have nothing else that can be stopped that is sustaining life, VSET is their only legal option that's available. So the challenge, there are a number of challenges, and they're quite significant, is to ensure that individuals and their supporters fully understand what is involved. And there can be no doubt that in the absence of an underlying disease like cancer, for example, fasting onto death is extremely challenging, and it requires great determination and consistent support by others. Even so, we're still hearing from folks who want to know that they can make this choice while still decisionally capable and before that window closes. As short-term memory begins to fade, remembering the decision to fast and why it was made can be very tricky. There are a number of ways that help others to succeed. Writing a letter to yourself, <coughs> explaining the reasons why you've made this decision and what kinds of conditions have been, become intolerable for you, or being videotaped when you're still decisionally capable of explaining to yourself why you've made this, and to others, why you've made this decision. These can be helpful. Getting hospice support for patients with early dementia is also very challenging. The place to start for palliative oversight is again with the primary care physician. If they understand the significance of this choice and the reasons why it's being made, they may well support the option of access to palliative care. I've been involved in educating quite a number of local physicians who had misconceptions or misunderstandings about the visa process. And now there are a growing number of medical reports and actually empirical studies that are helpful in explaining and demystifying the process. So that's another way of educating dogs. Once the person makes a decision to fast and has done so for several days, the primary care physician may agree to make a referral for a hospice home care. One of the great challenges for those with a diagnosis of early stage Alzheimer's disease is the need to take steps to hasten their death while living may still be a source of pleasure for them, but they have to decide now before that window of opportunity closes. So I'm going to stop now because Tim might want to speak. <laughs> Thank you for your attention.
Okay. So if you missed the first remarks, that's a shame because all the answers to your questions were in those remarks. <laughs> Let me just quickly remind us of the definition uh, of voluntarily stopping eating and drinking because it's important to remember, to, to remember what it is and what it isn't. So we're talking about patients who have a terminal illness, who are experiencing significant stress, who are still able to eat and drink on their own, who are able to make and express voluntary decisions, um, but who have decided that they want to hasten their death. So they stop eating and drinking with the explicit intent of hastening their death. And I repeat that just to make a, a careful distinction between that and something that we're all probably familiar with, which is uh, people, say, in late stages of dying from cancer, where their body shuts down and they naturally stop eating and drinking because they no longer need to eat and drink. Their body is telling them that they're done. This is different. These are people who still can eat and drink. They are voluntarily choosing not to explicitly to hasten their death. So I have two, maybe three, depending on how much time we have, things to think about with you in the presentation part of my remarks. So the first is, um, since I'm a guy who spends a lot of time thinking and writing about ethics and healthcare, I thought it might be good for us to think for a few minutes about if and why voluntarily stopping eating and drinking is morally significant. Because if it doesn't seem morally significant, then you can write it the wrong guy to talk to you tonight. Um, the next is, um, if it is, and I think it is, then what are the ethical questions that tend to come up surrounding voluntarily stopping eating and drinking? Because there are a core handful that come up again and again in the literature, in discussions in the media, or in public discussions. And then the last, is if we have time. Thinking about uh, some of the opportunities, some of the challenges in engaging in a process like this uh, if you're enrolled in hospice care. Uh, and uh, I'm guessing that Judy asked me to talk a little bit about that because one of the things I've done in my consulting life is I've worked with some hospices across the country to help them develop policies and practices to engage patients who are choosing to hasten their death in this way. And I've learned a little bit uh, about what folks who work in hospice in general, uh, what they think of this process and, and some of the challenges in implementing some of these policies across the country. So let's take the first question. The first question is, is it ethically significant? Uh, and one way to answer that question is to think about four different domains in which it might be ethically significant. So we could think about the personal, the relational, the clinical, and the social and political. Then it could be seen as a significant benefit. That suffering doesn't have to continue. Um, there is a way to end it. Um, another way to think about whether it's morally significant in terms of the personal realm is to think about whether it impacts any of the rights, obligations, and duties we have. And a lot of the language that I hear when people talk about this, especially in public discussions, people often use the language of rights. Language like, you don't have the right to force me to eat if I don't want to eat. You don't have the right to force me to drink if I don't want to drink. So, you know, in philosophy we call this the negative right. The idea that I have the right to say no to something and you can't do it without my permission. Um, on the other side, um, folks who are very concerned, say, about not feeding people who seem to be willing to eat, um, might say, we have a positive right to eat and drink. Right? It's necessary for our sustenance. Um, and not feeding or not giving fluids to someone who seems really to want to eat or drink violates a basic right that they have. So um, whether you're thinking that we said it is something that um, should be defended as a right, or you have serious concerns about we said, on either side of that set of thinking, it seems to be morally significant. 
because there's serious impact and it affects rights. Uh, I would suggest it's also ethically significant from a relational point of view. Judy did a nice job of emphasizing how it's extraordinarily difficult to engage in this process alone. This is something that requires the assistance of trusted people in your life. Now, these could be hired caregivers, but many times these are your family and friends. You're involving them in this process. So yes, you take moral responsibility for your own death. You can't delegate that. That's a key point. I really like the way you put that. But you're involving other people. They feel morally complicit in what's going on. You're asking for their assistance. You're asking them to do very challenging things. Like maybe if you ask for a drink or something to eat, maybe you've also asked them for their first response to not be to just run and get it, but to sit down, to resist, to explain to you, remind you that you didn't want to do this and why. That may be very difficult. They love you. That's why they're next to you. So we're involving people morally in this process. It affects deeply relationships, and I would suggest that it's therefore relationally significant in an ethically important way. Um, that's good for that. The third of the fourth realm is clinical. So um, another thing that you mentioned is how doing this well, if by well we mean engaging in the process to speed up dying, that doesn't create more suffering than your illness was creating. <clears throat> it means you need the involvement and support, the really ready availability of clinicians. Clinicians who can teach you and your family members and loved ones what to look for, how to take care of your mouth needs, for example. Um, people who can help teach, for example, uh, once you lose uh, the ability to participate uh, or ambulate, things like this. Um, who can help you with care, personal hygiene care, things like this, and the ability to prescribe quickly um, medications that may be needed to deal with restlessness, agitation, delirium, pain, um, or to adjust those medications if you're already on standing doses for your underlying illness. There can be, depending on the clinicians involved, a wide spectrum of understanding and acceptance of voluntarily stopping eating and drinking. So if we're talking about hospice clinicians, I've devoted my life to working with hospice clinicians. I think they're some of the best people on the planet. Part of what makes them such good clinicians is that they're extremely passionate about what they do. They didn't go into this work for the money or the glory. They went into it to make the, to make the world a better place. Um, that passion can have a downside in that they may passionately believe that the only good way to die is to let nature take its course. And trying to speed that process up by not eating and not drinking, they may have some moral resistance to that. Or they may not understand what it is. Uh, I ran into my neighbors on the way out of my apartment building to come here tonight. I said, where are you going? I'm going to give a talk on Visa. This is two young kids and uh, their daughter, who's about one and a half. Uh, daughter didn't know what he said was. I'll take care of that on the way home. <laughs> but they have no idea either. And they're not unusual. Right? This is not a mainstream conversation that you and I are having tonight. Uh, it's also not mainstream knowledge amongst clinicians, even really seasoned clinicians who work with people exclusively in the end of life. So just like we're asking loved ones to be involved, uh, and they may feel more complicit in this process, which is not necessarily a negative thing, right? They may feel they're doing something good. Um, the evolution, both in psychiatric and in palliative care thinking, about how there are significant distinctions between suicidality when you're 14 and your girlfriend breaks up with you, and <laughs> when you're 84 and you have you know, end-stage pancreatic cancer, those gradations, those nuances, they weren't there in the literature during the training 20, 30 years ago. So this means that not only are we asking for the assistance of clinicians, but they may have very powerful beliefs and values, personal or professional, that have to be engaged, which makes it, it seems to me, morally significant in a clinical way. And then finally is the social and the political. 
So, by political here, I don't mean something like, you know, this, this is this topic that Donald Trump would tweet about. Uh, if other options were available, this probably wouldn't be the one most folks chose. Even more than that, it's happening in a social environment where there are very powerful beliefs, customs, cultural values associated with food and drink itself. I have a big extended family that I hardly ever see. You know what I see when somebody dies, when somebody's born, or when somebody gets married? And you know what we do with all three of those things? We, we get drunk. <laughs> and eating and drink is at the core um, of these ritual celebrations in my family. Um, uh, food and drink, this is what we do to mark special occasions. It has enormous social value, enormous social value attached to happy things. Well, maybe not the funerals, but the births and the marriage, well, maybe not all the marriages. <laughs> but, <laughs> let's say it has enormous significance. Right? Um, so for someone then to say they don't want to eat or drink anymore, there's someone you love. Right? You're sad, you're going to miss them, they're dying. Well, what do we do when we visit people in the hospital? We bring them soup, right? Or we bring them something. Uh, my mother is forever asking me when I'm sick, do I have enough to eat? My mother doesn't know about seamless. <laughs> seamless, for those of you who don't know, is an online place where you can order food and drink. All of these cultural values surrounding food and drink, they play a big part, I think, in what makes it challenging for family members to support a decision to stop eating and drinking. And then finally, it's unfolding in a very particular legal context. Judy mentioned this as well. I can tell you that one of the ongoing challenges for the hospice organizations that I've counseled across the country on this is what are you going to write on the death certificate after this person dies as the cause of death? Cancer. I guess there's no question there. Okay. <laughs> but you see the dilemma, right? If you write death by voluntarily, <coughs> voluntary terminal dehydration, all kinds of questions come up. Well, was well, there an anti-suicide clause and their life insurance policy and the this trigger? Um, am I being honest by talking about the underlying illness and not the proximate cause of death? Do, in fact, we have any control? In New York State, anyway, it is up solely to the physician's individual discretion what they write on the death certificate. So thinking about these things ahead of time with the physician who you think is going to be working on the death certificate is important. Um, and it's another way in which we're asking other people in our lives to be a part of the process. So for all of these reasons, I would say it is ethically significant. It's ethically significant at the personal level, at the relational level, the clinical level, and at the social level. Uh, let me just say a few words about the questions that often come up either in discussions or in the literature. According to this, I have five and a half minutes left. However, Judy went over by 4.25 minutes. <laughs> the first one that always comes up, maybe obvious, but I think it's worth talking about for a few minutes, is he said suicide. And if it's suicide, what follows from that? So the answer, obviously being a philosopher, I'm not going to give you an answer to this question. But <laughs> the answer depends on how you define suicide. So if you have a very simplistic conceptual definition of suicide, you know, an action taken by someone to bring about their own death, okay, yeah, it's suicide. <laughs> but if we look to the clinical literature, you know, is it suicide, for example, in a way that would warrant psychiatric intervention? Um, <coughs> I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a clinician, so I'm not giving you a clinical answer to this, but conceptually, there are significant differences between engaging in a process like voluntarily stopping eating and drinking and committing suicide. Just a handful of the differences. By definition, voluntarily stopping eating and drinking is not impulsive. It takes weeks. It's different than jumping off a bridge or pulling a trigger on a fire. There's time uh, to evaluate whether or not you have disordered thinking, anything that would be considered a thought disorder. Uh, 
time to consider whether or not there have been significant changes in your mood, anything that would qualify as a mood disorder. Um, there's plenty of time to evaluate that and to refer for more support if that's the case. And I would encourage, in fact, organizations that are going to support folks through this process, not necessarily to have a mandatory evaluation like this, but to know what to look for and to slow down the process if it's the case that we see evidence of a thought disorder or a mood disorder. <coughs> there are other differences. Uh, we've just described a process that's thoroughly relational social. Um, people talk about the planet with their family, loved ones, and caregivers. This is the complete opposite of the lead up to a suicide in which patients withdraw, they don't share plans with others, um, they're not willing to acknowledge, to explain reasons for what they're about to do. Finally, uh, the complicating factor in terms of something like the DSM-5, the psychiatric manual, um, is that what counts as being suicidal, what counts as an appropriate desire, um, changes significantly in the presence of a life-limiting or terminal illness. Wanting to die when you're suffering from a serious illness that's only going to progress, clinically, is much different than wanting to die when you're perfectly healthy. So I would suggest conceptually for these five reasons that there are big differences between being suicidal and moving towards executing a plan of voluntarily stopping eating and drinking. And that's important, at least from an ethical point of view, because the next question that comes up after is it suicide is usually, well, if I help my wife, my husband, my mom, my dad with this, am I breaking the law by assisting a suicide? And if there's a strong ar argument to say that what they're doing is not suicide, then there's also a strong argument to say what you're doing is not assisting suicide. So I'm not giving you legal advice here. I'm saying conceptually, there's a way here um, to make a very strong case that no, that's not what you're doing. Now, a few more questions that come up, which I'm really not going to give answers to. I'm just going to throw them out there. So one is, uh, What's the relevance ethically of the presence of a serious or life-limiting or terminal illness here? The definition uh, that Judy gave at the beginning was, this is someone who has a terminal illness. Why didn't you be terrible in the right Okay, we'll check the tape. Could you, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, fair enough. Right. Um, I raised the question because some of the literature would say uh, terminal illness. And I think it's worth thinking about, ethically, why would this be a different act if you had a serious illness or you were terminally ill, as opposed to if you didn't? If there's a strong ethical argument to be made that this is okay to do if you're expected to die within six months or a year, why would it not be okay to do if you're expected to die in four, five, six, seven years? <coughs> or if it's not okay in four, five, six, seven years, why would it be okay? So what's the moral relevance, say, of how soon you're expected to die or how serious your illness is? And the same goes for suffering. And I think this is an especially interesting question, at least for me. Right? The presence of intolerable suffering. I think you did say that was one of the criteria. Um, and, you know, interestingly, as far as I know, it's not one of the criteria in the states where a dying is So this sets a somewhat higher level. Yeah. Did, did I interrupt you? <laughs> so, um, again, I think it's one of these ethical questions to ask well. What is it about the presence of suffering that affects the moral value of the act that makes it okay or not okay? Um, and then finally, and, and this is something that came up at the end of Judy's talk, how far do we really want to go in defining what it means to be voluntary? I mean, voluntary, it's right in the title of the process, voluntarily stopping eating and drinking. Do we mean by that? Um, that it has to be contemporaneously voluntary. In other words, right now, as I'm about to be in the process, 
I need to be able to make the decision, explain why I'm making this decision, so on and so forth. I think that that's how that's how it's interpreted in literature anyway. Um, and usually, uh, I think uh, amongst folks like you who, who counsel and support people who are thinking about this decision, that, that's a criterion. Yeah. Um, but the question you raise is, could we exercise this voluntariness prospectively? In other words, could I say now with clear mind, decisional capacity, no coercion, when I get to the point when I don't recognize my children, that's when I don't want to be offended. That raises a, a lot of questions, right? Questions about should you be able to make that kind of decision ahead of time? If at that point you still want to eat, should we be respecting the you then or the you now? Right? It's not like you're no longer a person or even more a person at that point. Um, is this the kind of thing that we should be able to plan for and request ahead of time, or not? And I suspect if voluntarily stopping eating and drinking becomes more common, if it moves into the public vocabulary, that that's going to be a question that raises itself towards the top of the priority list to think about. Because on the one hand, I support the idea of thinking about it contemporaneously. In other words, I'm much less comfortable honoring the choice made five years ago if I have a patient here now who, perhaps confused, still very much wants to eat a drink. I worry. Right? Um, and there was another half of that point. And it was a good one. <laughs> so, the other half of that though is that it puts you in a very tragic position, right? Of having them to move through the process now while you still have a quality of life that you feel is acceptable, while you still do recognize everyone. So it has this unintended effect. Protecting the new five years from now has the unintended effect, in some cases, of having you end your life three or four years before you would really want to, just to be sure that you still have the legal and the right to do so. So, um, I've hit 25 minutes. I'm going to turn it back over to Terry. And we have uh, lots of time, I think, for questions from Terry. Or Terry. Thank you, Tim. You know, you're me. Come join us at the table. I do want to make sure that we have more than adequate time for everyone, if possible, to join us in questions and comments. I do want to preface that part with a question for each of our speakers, and then, having established that the microphones are available, to ask folks to say who they are, that we respect privacy if you wish not to, who's going to force you. But in addition to making comments brief, um, and if there are anecdotes or particular cases or issues that you'd like to pursue, I know that both of our speakers will stay afterwards and perhaps offer aid and comfort in specific situations. But please keep it brief so we can maximize the number of participants. Um, a question for Judy. Uh, when you work with a family and friends of a patient who has made a decision, at least at the moment, to pursue the process of visa, what kind of responses did you often either anticipate or get from family members? Tolstoy says at the beginning of Anna Karenina that all happy families are alike, but each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way, unless you meet with families who are very different from those who are, let's say, my family. Uh, you will almost always when you not find some conflict, some disorder, some memory that could be an impediment to agreement. Um, what sorts of things, Judy, have you anticipated? And what sort of things have you encountered? Don't make an exhaustive list. I'm not, because I think people want to have their own questions answered. What I hear most often from family members once the process has begun is how long will this take? And this 
this is an impossible question to answer, and yet it's a very understandable question to ask because they are witnessing a choice that their loved one has made to leave them, and to leave them by choice. And at the very least, they don't want them to have to suffer. So if they believe that this suffering is ongoing, it is really, really hard for them. So I can tell you that I am on the phone every single day with those with patients so long as they can talk, but most often with the family members, because they need a great deal of support. So I'm going to stop there. Thanks. And Tim, uh, I'm very happy to hear your emphasis on both autonomy and on relationality, if that's a term, because very few people are islands unto themselves. <laughs> Though we do have an increasing number of patients we see that are beginning to be called in the literature unbefriended patients patients who are alone. Uh, I saw two of them yesterday in an intensive care unit. But in general, your emphasis upon making choices that are informed and that are either contemporaneous or even more long-lasting uh, raises a question for me. Psychiatrists almost always can find depression symptoms as often as they like. You know the old expression, when you have a hammer, everything seems like a nail. Well, there's no doubt, and I've worked with psychiatrists a lot, uh, that they can spot it, particularly since the symptomatology of depression and of facing the end of life per se are often very parallel with overlaps. Um, but how can you be sure that an autonomous being is choosing to go forward with said when there are so many opportunities for duress, for stress, for anxiety, and what do you do to try to compensate for that to make it a real choice? Yeah, so it's a very good question. Uh, and I'll just preface the response by again saying I'm not a clinician, so I'm not the best person, I think, to, to answer that question. But I'll make a distinction that may be helpful. Um, and the distinction is between someone with decision-making capacity and wondering or diagnosing the presence of something like depression or anxiety. In other words, a diagnosis or even suspicion of depression or anxiety does not preclude decision-making capacity. Um, many of us move through periods of depression or anxiety in our lives. Uh, in New York City, we support all industry of therapists. <laughs> help us with these kinds of things. You know, and it's quite possible for someone to be depressed and have complete decision-making capacity. Um, same goes with anxiety. Now, I don't mean that distinction to sound flippant, sir, because um, your question is really not so much is it possible to have both. Um, but at what point does the depression or anxiety become coercive such that it begins to affect maybe not decision-making capacity, but the voluntariness of your decisions. Because we do know right, that anxiety can be crippling, and such crippling anxiety can be coercive. You know, hopelessness can quickly move into depression. Uh, that can cause a distorted view of what options are available, uh, or it can even reduce the ability to cope or the perception that someone will be able to cope even with the systems. So, I don't have a strong answer to the question. Um, I think this is, this is an area in which uh, an interdisciplinary team, not unlike ones that are available on hospice, would be well positioned to think about the presence of decision-making capacity, the extent to which there is a uh, supportive family or a network of friends and caregivers involved. Um, and uh, the extent to which there may be concerns about um, mood or anxiety that should be referred to a specialist. Um, because surely we wouldn't want... No, I'm going to stop that uh, sentence. Um, surely we would want to offer that kind of support and make sure that a patient knows it's available um, as part of the informed consent process about these if we thought it was appropriate for that kind of support to be there. Thank you.
Now, uh, 